Well, good morning and welcome to worship here at Heritage Church on this Lord's Day that God gives us once again to gather as his people. Special welcome uh, to those of you who are guests with us this morning. And uh, we trust as we worship that we'll do so with uh, spirit and truth and exalting in the name of Jesus. I invite you to stand as we hear from God and his word this morning, which calls to those who are needy and weary and wandering. The prophet Isaiah writes these words, Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good. And your soul will delight in the richest of fare. The prophet Isaiah, so many centuries ago, yet the word of God that speaks to us this morning, come, come to that which is freely given. We are here this morning not because our righteousness makes us worthy, but because Jesus' righteousness comes to us. God has chosen us, Christ has purchased us, and the Spirit has sealed us for eternity. So come and drink deeply from the well that will never run dry. As we gather this morning, receive also God's welcome and blessing. Grace to you and peace from God who is our Father in Christ, who is our Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit who stirs our hearts to worship again this morning. Together, God's people say, Amen. Please join me in prayer. Now, but Father, it is a privilege to praise you. As we sing, let us make a joy noise to you as we pray. May our words and thoughts be a pleasing aroma to you. As we open your word, may we trust in your unfailing promises. Your word holds true. It is living. It is active. It is sharper than a two-edged sword. Open the eyes of our hearts that we may see you more clearly and worship Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. And let's worship our Savior as we sing together meekness and majesty.
you may be seated. In Hebrews 12, verse 1, we read that God calls us to throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles as we run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. This morning as we worship, it is good for us to pause and remember that our sin can make us feel so faithless. The gospel reminds us that our hope rests in God's faithfulness and not in our own. He is faithful and promises as 1 John 1 that when we confess our sin, He forgives us and purifies us from all unrighteousness. And in that promise, we come once again to God's throne of grace this morning. And in doing so, let us confess our sins to God through a spoken prayer of confession. Together we pray these words. Father, forgive us. Though you should guide us, we inform ourselves. Though you should rule us, we control ourselves. Though you should fulfill us, we console ourselves. For we think your truth too high, your will too hard, your power too remote, your love too free, but they are not. Without them, we are a people most miserable. Heal our confused mind with your word. Heal our divided will with your law. Heal our troubled conscience with your love. Heal our anxious hearts with your presence. All for the sake of your Son, who loved us and gave himself for us. Amen. Listen to these words also this morning from the prophet Isaiah. He called us to worship, to come and seek that which is freely given. He also writes these words in Isaiah 1 verse 18. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. People of God, there is power in the blood of Jesus, which calls us again to worship this morning. The power of God's grace to forgive every sin and to seal every heart to himself. How then should we live as those who know the forgiveness and mercy of God's grace? Well, we come to that this morning in our service, and our hearts need to seek to follow Jesus. Jesus, as we submit to his rule and reign as Savior and also as Lord. That life is captured throughout Scripture, but this morning we're going to read together some verses from uh, Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 4, and these are our commitment once again. And we make this weekly knowing again next week we're going to need to make it again. But that is the journey of sanctification. Listen again as I'll read this part and invite you to read the people part with me. Here is our commitment to a, a gospel-shaped life that is driven by God's mercy. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4, Do not let any, any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, Forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. As those who have once again committed our life to Jesus this morning, it is only fitting that we feed ourselves once again also on God's Word. I invite you to turn in a Bible with me at this time as we continue our series in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 2, uh, starting at verse 17. The words will be on the screen in just a moment as well, but 1, 000, page 1,178 in your pew Bible. So the question that we're looking at this morning is that should followers of Jesus be relevant or resilient? We've been looking at that throughout this series uh, it started out, this is the uh, would-you-rather question. Would you rather be relevant 
Or would you rather be resilient? And this is the question that Paul is asking this little group of believers uh, in the city of Rome. And that's what God is asking us here this morning. Will we, will we conform to the world and its patterns? Or will we be set apart, as Jesus calls us to, unashamed of the gospel, as Paul mentions here in Romans 1, verse 17? Relevance is tempting. The pressure to fit in, to be loved, to be known, it's constant. But Paul tells us God wants us to be a resilient church. But what makes that difficult, as Paul looks at it here in Romans 1 and Romans 2 especially, is we have this sinful nature that has so corrupted everything that we're daily tempted in ways that sometimes we don't even know. We're daily tempted to submit or to conform to the patterns that are not following Jesus. As we look this morning at this passage in Romans 2, we're going to hear that sometimes, sometimes we'll be tempted in the face of those temptations to play our immunity card. That's what Paul tackles in this passage. Sometimes we think we can hold up certain credentials, certain credentials that either make us immune from God's judgment or somehow make us more resilient in our world today. And that's what Paul tackles in this passage. But before we hear from God's Word, join me in prayer once again this morning as we ask for the Spirit's blessing on this time. Let's pray together. Come, Holy Spirit, into our weary and worn out and weeping hearts. We need this truth to penetrate, to feed our hearts and souls so that we would walk in the way that Jesus calls us to. Thank you for giving us this time on a weekly basis to just pause and hear to ingest, and then to go. Bless this time as we need your leading. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word this morning. Romans 2, verses 17 through 29. Paul is once again tackling, as I mentioned a moment ago, this credentialing system that some people use when it comes to faith. Listen to God's Word. Now you, if you call yourself a Jew... If you rely on the law and brag about your relationship to God, if you know His will and approve what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor to the foolish, a teacher of infants, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then, who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who brag about the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Circumcision has value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. If those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as those who were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you, who even though you have the written code and circumcision are a lawbreaker. A man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Spirit, not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from men, but from God. This is God's word for us this morning. You may be seated once again. It's what some would consider probably a really good plot line to a movie or a TV show, and I must admit, I, I think I've seen it a few times in my life. So here's the scenario. A foreign diplomat or a government official from a, a foreign country goes on a, a, a crime spree, and just use your imagination. Hollywood has a great way of exemplifying bad behavior. And this person, this individual, uh, let's, let's say it's a man, just for the sake of it. He's apprehended by, uh, by authorities. And uh, he's got a smug look on his face. And if you're familiar with where I'm going, you know he's going to pull out his 
diplomatic immunity card, as if that card actually exists. Could somebody let some of our guests in this morning? He holds up a diplomatic immunity card and says, hey, it's like a get out of jail card, right? Get out of jail free card, as if everything I did, I am not responsible for. I am immune from prosecution. How many of you have maybe seen a movie or a TV show similar to that plot line? Please tell me I'm not alone. Now, this is going to date me a little bit, but um, this is the one that popped into my mind. Uh, I remember watching uh, Chuck Norris, America's Greatest Hero. Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, Walker, Texas Ranger. This was the plot line. I don't know why I remember. It's probably 20 years ago, but as I was writing the sermon this week, I thought, man, I remember this one episode, and it's amazing the things I remember uh, from so long ago. But this was the plot line. Some diplomat from a foreign country comes, does some heinous act, and and claims to be uh, untouchable. Now, for the basis of education here this morning, you should know that diplomatic immunity doesn't work like this. Uh, it's not a get-out-of-jail card uh, that you can just wave about. Another reason why we, we, we shouldn't really believe everything we see on the screen. Uh, still, it makes for a rather captivating plot line. It could also be an answer to, as I thought about it, an answer to that superpower question. Maybe you've been asked this. Uh, if you could have a superpower, what would it be? And maybe diplomatic immunity is what you're looking for. That probably sounds better in my head. But uh, Paul, here in this passage, is feeling compelled to deal with this issue of those who think they have spiritual immunity. Regardless of what they have done, but because of who they think they are. They waive their credentials, and Paul says, that is not a go. I don't care what you have, who you think you are, you do not get a pass on God's judgment against your sin. Now, I mentioned last week, Paul shifts his attention in chapter 2. He talks about a you in verses 1 to 16, and and I argued that I believe that focuses on general on those who um, they're not convinced that they need God's gospel. And that's because they do this thing where they say, well, uh, person A uh, is a murderer and all I did was steal a pack of gum. And therefore, my righteousness is so much superior to hers or his. Uh, I'm OK. And that's what Paul tackles in verses one to 16. Everybody, he would argue, everybody needs the gospel. The only hope we have is in Jesus. No matter what a goody two-shoes you may be, we see all of sin, all, of, all the immorality out in our world today, and we cannot presume for a second that our righteousness is somehow better by comparison. Well, now we see here in this passage, Paul begins to focus in a particular way. That was a more general way. Now he focuses particularly on uh, this is Rome, and apparently there's a Jewish community in, in this big city, and he, he addresses this group. He addresses them very specifically. I mentioned this briefly last week, but it was a commonly held belief uh, within the Jewish community uh, that because they were God's chosen, so now you need to know Old Testament theology, God calling Abraham, calling his people out, and he says, you are my chosen, my special people in the world. But what happened is this, this bad belief took place that said, because I'm God's chosen, chosen, I'm exempt from God's judgment against my sin. I can, I can do whatever I want. And if you want a great way of seeing why that doesn't work, just spend some time in the prophets in which the prophets are raised by God to say, that's a no-go. You don't get to do whatever you want. You don't get to oppress the poor. You don't get to uh, 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 deny the, the status of widows and the orphans and such. You don't get to do that. You do not get to wave your spiritual immunity card. Well, now in verses 17 to 20, if we look right at our passage, there's a lot of if statements, and it's very clear that... Uh, Paul is being a bit rhetorical here. He knows who these people are. He knows their, their, their condition, but he also knows their status. They did at one time. They had an amazing relationship with God. When you are chosen, that status matters. Paul says if, if you were uh, a Jew, you, uh, you could brag about your relationship with God. You could know that you were superior because, well, you had God's truth. I mean, the, the Ten Commandments came down. And this was God's truth for the people. Couldn't be clearer. 
You not only had a special relationship, you not only had God's will, God says, I want you to be a light to the nations. Paul talks about that here as well. It's no wonder that they felt some confidence in being guides to the blind, lights for those in darkness, and teachers to those who are immature. But in asking and stating all of this, Paul is saying, now all of those credentials, and they're impressive, none of them give you a pass on God's call to be resilient and to take sin seriously. See, what happened, and now I'm speaking somewhat generally, it didn't happen to all within the Jewish community. There were always a remnant. Even Elijah on the day after Mount Carmel, when he thought he was all alone, God said, oh, no, no, there's, there's many who haven't bent their knee to, to the Baal and the idols. Not all fit this category, but what happened within this Jewish community <coughs> is that they thought, hey, it doesn't matter what I do. I'm God's chosen. And that's that diplomatic immunity, that spiritual immunity card that they would wave. They had had this incredible opportunity, just as we do today and post this side of the cross as followers of Jesus, we have an incredible opportunity, and we waste it too often, but an incredible opportunity to be God's people in the world, to be a light. But even that, though they had it then, they failed to realize. So they claim one thing about themselves, they didn't live up to their status. And, and here's just this truth that applies to us today. One can claim to know God and yet not know Him. One can talk a great talk, and yet still be far from God. Isn't that the nature of what we define as hypocrisy? And that's Paul's point. You can wave whatever credentials you think you have, and think that you are immune because of your special place in this world with God. But then listen to what the prophet Isaiah says. You worship God with your lips, but your heart is far from Him. You may worship God with exuberance and delight and passion, and yet your heart can still be far from Him. And this is the devastating result, says Paul. It is said of you, God's name is blasphemed. Let the weight of that stick for you for a minute. God's name is blasphemed, it's muddied, it's dirtied, it's neglected, it's rejected. I mean, put in the words there, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles, among those who are far from Jesus, because of you. No sadder words, and a lot of sad words can be said about followers of Jesus today, but no sadder words could be used than this. To claim to belong to God only to find out that by how we live, it's furthest from the truth. And because of that, how we live blasphemes God's name. In other words, people look at us, and you can think of the contemporary, right? Well, you call yourself a Christian, but, and uh, uh, sadly, a lo lot of legitimate reasons why those who are far from Jesus say, if that's the Jesus you follow, I don't want anything to do with him. Now, Jesus says one day we're going to have to give an account to the Father for every word we speak, so let that sit with us this morning. But imagine this, that how we live can be a hindrance to people who want the need to hear the story of God's grace. Doesn't that make your heart sad? Doesn't that make you think, oh. And here is Paul kicking out a prop from under the feet of any in that Jewish community who think, man, it doesn't matter what I do. I've got my, my card, my chosen card. Paul just takes it and knocks that prop right out from underneath them and says, that doesn't matter at all if by how you're living there is no connection that you truly belong. Put that in our own contemporary, right? If you think you have a special exemption with God because you're from a Christian home, or you attended youth group, or, or whatever uh, immunity card you think you hold up, it doesn't work. Paul says there are no exceptions. None. The only way we get anywhere 
is the righteousness of Christ. That is the only card you can hold. And so we're looking at Romans, and Paul is writing to the church. He says, I want you not to pursue relevance. I want you to be resilient. And the heart of a resilient follower of Jesus is one that says, all I have is the righteousness of Jesus. That's all I have, and it's all I need. And there's a gut check moment in this passage in which you and I have to think, now, what, what cards am I holding up? What cards am I holding up? That I'm an American citizen or Canadian? That I'm white? That I have some status, a job, privilege? What sort of things do we look at that Paul in this passage says, man, that just doesn't count if your life is not walking resiliently with Jesus. You've got nothing. So that's the first part of what Paul tackles, and, and we have to wrestle with this question. We have to wrestle. Does my life deter those who need to hear about God's grace? There's a lot of inward heart look that's got to happen here for us. we really got to be serious on it. But that's only the first part of what Paul tackles here in this passage. The next thing he does, as if that wasn't hard enough for the Jewish community, is Paul tackles circumcision next. And his point is quite simple, and it's a complicated, in a way, somewhat complicated topic to talk about circumcision, but you need to know that God gave circumcision to the people to set them apart in the world, a physical mark of a spiritual reality. The problem is the spiritual reality was not passing through as a life of obedience for God's people, and that made the circumcision irrelevant, meaningless. And that's what Paul's saying here, really. Circumcision, no substitute, for obedience. What had, what had happened is then this belief, again, had grown up within that person that said, if I'm circumcised, I'm automatically saved. And we have a New Testament example of this. It happens in the church. Some will say, I'm baptized, therefore I'm saved. We call that the bad theology of baptismal regeneration. You can Google that and find out more. But that's the, it's bad theology. It's not biblical. Circumcision or baptism, here's two things to say about them, and it's a great subject to learn more about because, uh, you know, you and I, we have to live our baptism if we're marked in the waters of Jesus. But here's the first thing. Circumcision or baptism, we talk about the equivalent between the Old Testament and New Testament here. First of all, they are signs that point to a greater truth. That's what they are. They're signs that point to a greater truth, that, that God is the one who saves us by grace. Remember your baptism. I know you don't remember it because more than likely, most of you, some of you know I were, were baptized uh, older, but most of you were baptized as a tiny little baby. You don't remember it, but we're called to remember what it means. It points to something. It has no value in me. It has value in the one who makes the promise. That's the first thing you need to know about baptism. The second is this, and this is Paul in the passage tackling circumcision, but it works for baptism. He's saying neither of them are a substitute for godliness. Neither of them are a substitute for obedience. You see, baptism is a mark of a covenant relationship. As I just said, God makes a promise. God promises to be your God from now into eternity. And he reveals it in the water of baptism, which points to Jesus. You see, we have to live into our baptism. And obedience is how that works. One person described or compared circumcision or our New Testament reality of baptism, compared it to a wedding ring between God and his people. Circumcision, like baptism, has immense value when we grasp its intended significance. If we remember that we're a marked people, that as we profess in the catechism, I'm not my own, but I belong. Or as Paul says, you were bought with a price. But if we live as if, and Paul is saying to this to the Jewish community, if you live as if your circumcision has no meaning, or if we live as if our baptism has no meaning. It's as meaningless as a wedding ring on an adulterer's finger. The promise is not being connected to the reality. And Paul's saying, 
you could be circumcised, or to us, you could be baptized, but if there's no connection between the promise to your reality, to how you're walking in obedience to Jesus, then that's just a spiritual credential card. You don't get to wave. Living by faith is how we embrace the promise made at our baptism. That's what we get to do. It's like asking someone this question. Are you a believer? And they would answer, well, yeah, I'm a member of Heritage CRC. Or are you a believer? And they'll say, yeah, I was, I was baptized as an infant. Of course I am. And Paul says here in this passage, no, that's not how it works. You can pull out your diplomatic or spiritual immunity card any which way you like, but if there's no corresponding connection between that and your life and how you're living and walking in obedience to Jesus, you're missing the point. Church membership does not mean you're saved. Baptism does not mean you're saved. Giving money to the church doesn't mean you're saved. These are all good things, right things, appropriate things, and so many others when it comes to discipleship. But what Paul is driving home is something we've heard throughout this series, and that is that the only righteousness that can save you comes from someone else. We like to say that we have great value, and we do. But the only righteousness that saves us comes from Christ. The only one. Membership matters, baptism matters, all of it, but they are not the equivalent of diplomatic immunity. That's why Paul writes here in verses 28 and 29 that uh, true circumcision is not only outwardly, but is circumcision of the heart. Because out of the heart comes all that we are. That's how a believer stands apart in this world. We're talking in this series, and we're going to hear it throughout this entire series. What does it mean to be a resilient follower of Jesus? What does it mean to be a resilient church of Jesus Christ? And Paul is saying here, stop waving the flags and cards of privilege. Stop waving this idea that somehow you're set apart and that means you're saved because of that. I mean, by, by some status you have or condition you've met or achievement you've accomplished. The essence of a follower of Jesus, the essence of a resilient believer is not outward but heartward. It's the heart of Jesus for us. So that if you go back to our passage, putting baptism where circumcision is mentioned, baptism is where our hearts were not only marked, but were led by the Spirit to, to seek what God seeks. Parents, we do this with our kids, hopefully, even subconsciously, daily reminding them, remember your baptism. God made a promise to you. In this crazy, chaotic world, that will never change. Run after that promise. Take hold of that promise. We do this as husbands and wives. We do this as friends to friends. We do this in, in, in work relationships to remember, remember the promise. Remember what it points to. That's how we stand apart. My confidence in this world is where my heart longs for more of Jesus. Not the praise of others, says Paul. Not the praise of men. Again, that's the relevance versus resilient point. I don't seek relevance. I want to be resilient, and I'm going to seek the praise of God. And that's the joy of my heart. And that needs to be the joy of our heart. And that's what Paul is tackling here. He's knocked out two big legs in this system that says, well, I'm a Jewish person, person of the promise, and I'm circumcised. And Paul says, man, none of that matters if you're not following God. Which gets back to what we're going to hear time and again in this series. We need the gospel. We don't have an immunity card. We don't have something we get to wave that says, get out of jail free card. We don't get that. It may make an interesting plot line in a screen TV show or movie, but it doesn't actually work. The place where the gospel speaks is to our heart, which calls us to follow Jesus. You can hold all sorts of credentials. I'm baptized. I attended Sunday school. I went on a mission trip. I, I vote one way or I vote another and so on. But it is meaningless if there is no circumcision 
of your heart. It's like when, you, when your children sometimes get in trouble and they start fighting and you say apologize and they say, oh, I'm sorry, but you know their heart's not in it. Right? Or when somebody's caught in some sin and I, oh, um, I feel so badly, but you know their heart's not in it. As the prophet Isaiah says, right, you worship me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. This is a discipleship issue. Our only hope, this is the point here that Paul is making, and I, I trust that we're going to take hold of this in the weeks to come and in the series too. Our, holy, our only hope is the one who makes us righteous. Our only hope. There is not one credential we possess that compares to the perfect obedience of Jesus who, who bore God's wrath against our sin. The only card, the only card we get to hold up is the one that says His righteousness is the solid ground on which I stand. And by faith in Him, I'm going to walk humbly in this world. Humbly, because I know I don't deserve an ounce of grace, but humbly walk with Jesus because I am so grateful to have what I don't deserve. And then I'm going to remain resilient. Otherwise, I'm going to become a hypocrite, and that's Paul's point here. But I'm going to be resilient so that the world does not have one more reason in me to reject Jesus. So here's the challenge. And there's always a challenge when it comes to reading Paul. But let's make our heart's passion to know Christ. We're going to sing a song at the end of our service, Knowing You. It's a beautiful song. But in the second verse it says, May my heart's desire be to know Christ more, to be found in Him, and to be known as His. That's a heart statement. Because God longs to see heart-shaped and heart-filled obedience from us if we know the gospel. If you don't know the gospel this morning, hear it. Hear it plainly. Through Jesus Christ, God forgives sin through the cross. Receive it. All you have to do is receive it by faith. The catechism class I'm teaching, we're talking about question and answer 60. Even though I deserve nothing, nevertheless, my favorite word, nevertheless, God grants and credits to me the perfect righteousness, satisfaction, and obedience of Jesus Christ. As if I'd never sinned or been a sinner, all I have to do is receive it by faith. That's how we get into the story. And if that's your story then hear what Paul says here. Don't be waving credential cards unless it's Jesus' righteousness. Be found in Him. Be known by Him. Come to Him. Walk in His presence. Let your heart be all about honoring Jesus' name because that's a resilient believer. Christ is the heart of the matter because ultimately it will be a matter of your heart. Let's check whatever privilege we think we have, whatever immunity credential we think we get, Let's check it at the door, and let's just take hold of Christ, the perfect satisfaction for our sin, and let that be the song and the story that we live in in the days to come. Please join me in it. God in heaven, what perfect righteousness we find in Jesus, the perfect satisfaction for your wrath against sin the perfect call to take up the cross and to follow the risen Savior. Forgive us, O oh God, where if we look at our heart in the last few days, we say, oh, there's the time when I thought my, my status was more important than anything. Give us humble hearts and then give us active feet that our heart and our feet would connect in such a way that we would live for Jesus a life that is true, striving to please Him in all that we do. This is what will make us resilient, O oh God. This is how we will be set apart in this world. More of Jesus, knowing Him, being found in Him, being known as His. May that be our heart's desire. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as our response to God's Word this morning, we've been looking at the Belgic Confession for our profession of faith. I invite you to stand as we do this in a question and answer format. Belgic, art, uh, Belgic Confession, Article 29, uh, one of the confessions of faith by which we declare, I mean, this is what we believe and this is who we are, in Article 29 has a beautiful statement about the church, what makes the church the church, which makes us uh, resilient for Jesus. I'll read the question. 
invite you to read the answer with me. Must we distinguish the true church from others? Oh, let's go, let's go back. There we go. We believe that we ought to discern diligently and very carefully by the word of God what is the true church. For all sects in the world today claim for themselves the name of the church. And how do we distinguish the true church? The true church can be recognized if it has the following marks. The church engages in the pure preaching of the gospel. It makes use of the pure administration of the sacraments as Christ instituted them. It practices church discipline for correcting faults. In short, it governs itself according to the pure word of God rejecting all things contrary to it, and holding Jesus Christ as the only head. How do we recognize those who belong to the true church? We can recognize them by distinguishing marks of Christians, namely by faith and by their fleeing from sin and pursuing righteousness once they have received the one and only Savior, Jesus Christ. They love the true God and their neighbors without turning to the right or left, and they crucify the flesh and its works. And how do true believers set them th themselves apart? Though great weakness remains in them, they fight against it by the Spirit all the days of their lives, appealing constantly to the blood, suffering, death, and obedience of the Lord Jesus, in whom they have forgiveness of their sins through faith in him. Amen. You may be seated at this time. Well, before we go to God in prayer this morning, a few prayer requests and items to share. By now, the vast majority of you know that on Friday afternoon, uh, Ken Fletcher completed his earthly journey and uh, walked into the presence of his Savior and Lord. This comes, uh, well, I mean, we all have our personal stories of Ken and our deep love for him and his deep love for the church. Uh, so this comes as sad news. Ken passed away as a result of uh, the COVID virus and other complications, and we want to lift up Judy and uh, Dan and Sarah and Mary and all the family as they enter this difficult week of grief. I don't have information at this time on visitation or the funeral. Uh, they are meeting today with the Langlands Family Funeral Home, and we'll have those posted to you more than likely this afternoon. So be sure to check your email or uh, other sources of information, and we will communicate that uh, to you. Yeah, obviously, I should say, clearly in light of COVID restrictions, it'll be... Uh, something for us to navigate this this week as we gather to remember God's faithfulness as his people here at Heritage Church. Let's keep them uh, in our prayer. Judy Swartz's sister Mary suffered a significant stroke earlier this week, and she passed away Friday morning. So let's keep Judy Swartz in our prayer as well. I want to pray for Ann Niebuhr as she is in her final weeks of life with her Diagnosis of bladder cancer, hospice is involved, and she's uh, under the highest level of pain management right now, and uh, it's just a matter of time when she comes to glory as well. So let's remember Nick and Anne in our prayers. Let's go to God in prayer. Loving God, we turn our hearts to you. As we've mentioned and heard already this morning, we are weary and worn out, and we are weeping. We are sad. We know the story of the gospel sings a beautiful song, and it is a song of love, our best love, a love that never fails, a love that is new every morning in Jesus, a love that we could never earn, a love that is about the perfect righteousness of Christ. And yet we are a weary and worn out and weeping people too. We know we do not get we deserve because of sin. We know we live in an imperfect and broken world, and, and so death comes to us. And we confess at times that 
we get so worn out by this. Yes, we even lament, O oh God, that we live in a world that witnesses events every day like this, but even greater travesties as well, events that dishonor your name and the names of, of those who are our neighbor. We cry out to you, O oh God, for your mercy. As so much talk takes place about cause and effect, may we not forget that your mercy lies deep within our story. So we pray this morning for the Fletcher family, for the Zwart family, for all those who mourn. This past month has been difficult for us as a church in this regard. Comfort us with your presence. Even as we heard from your word this morning, we cling to that one credential we need, which is the perfect righteousness of Jesus. He is our hope. We pray for one another today and for those who are sitting next to us, our neighbors around the world who call out and cry out to you. We pray for healing in the places of our brokenness. We pray for, for comfort that comes from you. We acknowledge, O oh God, that in the past six months, a pandemic, pandemic has uh, swept this world and has caused some really difficult realities. Comfort your children. We pray, O oh God, for friends and family members today facing health issues, maybe relationship challenges, financial messes. Jesus, we pray you would lift the weight of their worries and give us the assurance of your engagement. We pray for our city. We're grateful, O oh God, that you've placed us here. There is so much need, and you've, you've put us on mission. To be a people who live each day under the goodness of your sovereign care. Thank you, God, for the joy that is found in living for Jesus. The joy of serving in Jesus' name. The joy of loving in Jesus' name. The joy of of giving our time and our talents and our treasures in Jesus' name. We pray for our missionaries. We thank you, God, for their tireless commitment to sharing the good news of Jesus as they, they show your love and transforming grace in their work. As they serve in your name and here in Kalamazoo and the state of Michigan, this nation and around the world, give them courage renewed conviction that your good news truly is good news. We pray for our church family here. Thank you for one another. We can encourage one another and support one another and pray for one another. We pray for your healing for Joe Wiles. We pray for peace for Ann Niebuhr as she comes to the closing days of her life. Sustain her and and Nick with your presence. We pray for our homebound members as they're not able to be here with us. And we pray, O oh God, that in the days to come, may the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be pleasing to you. May we seek first your kingdom and its righteousness. May our lives tell the story of belonging to Jesus so that it does not hinder anyone of asking what makes the difference? We pray all of this, O oh God, and so much more because you've told us to cast all of our cares on you. May we trust in your strength as we head into the new week and put our hope in you for every tomorrow. In Jesus' name, amen. A couple of announcements. Uh, this coming Saturday is uh, a wedding happening here at the church at 3 o'clock. Cassidy Bruinwood and Tim Brennan will be united in marriage and just encourage you to pray for them and uh, celebrate this wonderful opportunity, this wedding day for our own little Cassidy uh, who grew up and now is getting married and we rejoice in that. A uh, reminder, we are meeting this evening for our evening service. We do have an announcement about next Sunday evening. We are canceling next Sunday evening service in light of the activities of this week. And just want to let you know about that in case um, uh, neighbors or friends were planning on coming to that service as well. Please let them know we're just suspending it and we'll meet again on the following Sunday. 
Uh, just as asked to remind you, uh, a couple Sundays ago, you were introduced to the Roshan Institute of Education. You can find out more about this. Asgar Gill is uh, one of our beloved brothers in Christ who worships here and is part of getting a school uh, started in uh, Pakistan in his hometown. And you can find out more information at the brochures at the Information Center. Our offering this morning supports the ministry of this church. We always engage Kingdom, Kingdom Initiative as well, and our Loose Change offering supports alternatives of Kalamazoo, uh, promoting the value of human life by serving the unborn and their families through the love of Jesus Christ. The offering will be received in baskets that are placed on chairs as you exit the sanctuary this morning. We remind you to please put your masks back on as you leave and to honor physical and social distancing uh, as appropriate. Uh, it's a nice day, so we'll be able to gather outside for fellowship, but you are allowed to remain in the building. But if in bu inside, uh, you do need to keep uh, your masks on. The uh, audio uh, video recording of our service will be posted hopefully today, maybe by tomorrow, as our technician who oversees that is uh, not available today, but we'll get that online as soon as possible. Let's stand as we are reminded that we do go not in our own strength, but in the strength of the one who calls us to himself. The book of Hebrews is a story of Scripture written to a people who are struggling, wondering if it's worth following Jesus. And the writer, we don't know who wrote the book, calls them to Jesus. Keep looking to Jesus. Look to Jesus who is the one who gives you access to the throne, the one who is the perfect Savior, the wonderful Shepherd, and the, the, God, the one who died for our sin, look to Christ. Fix your eyes on him. This is the call to resilience as followers of Jesus. Go with God's blessing, and following this, we'll sing together the song, Knowing You. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And together, God's people say, Amen. <laughs>